Sutton Hoo is the site of an Anglo-Saxon burial ground in Suffolk in East Anglia. Um, it's on high ground above the River Deben, about seven or eight miles inland from the North Sea. It was in use for several centuries and contains a variety of types of burial, from cremation urns to interment. But it's best known for the discovery of a ship burial in 1939, and in particular for the artefacts that came out of that find, including this spectacular Anglo-Saxon warrior's helmet. This is a replica of the helmet, which is on display at the Exhibition Centre at Sutton Hoo itself. The original in its restored form is uh, on display at the British Museum. The helmet and the multitude of other treasures that were uncovered at the site belong to King Reedwald of the East Anglias, who ruled at the beginning of the 7th century. And he was buried in a sort of hut-like structure um, within the ship, which was then covered by an earth mound. There are something like 17 mounds at Sutton Hoo, and iron rivets have been found in one other in 1938, uh, Mound 2. So undoubtedly there were other ship burials there, but uh, so far... Mound 1 is the only mound that's turned up an intact treasure trove. This is Mound 2, where the other iron rivets were found. So there was certainly a ship burial there. As you can see um, from this viewing platform, which is uh, placed on the public footpath beside the burial site, it's a very extensive area. And... Uh, large number of these mounds have been left untouched by archaeologists simply to allow future science to glean more information from them when they are finally excavated. One of the things I find really interesting about this place is how people's perception of it changed over the course of time. There's archaeological evidence that the surrounding countryside was first uh, cleared of forest and uh, cultivated by the beaker folk. This is a shot of Sutton Heath that gives you some idea of what the countryside must have looked like when the Anglo-Saxons first appeared. The Romans really didn't change its appearance during their occupation of England. One of the prominent features of the countryside are a whole series of rivers running parallel from west to east and uh, entering the North Sea and obviously pointing straight across the North Sea at Frisia and the continental area that the Angles and Saxons first came from. This is the River Deben itself. At the head of this river is Rendlesham where uh, King Greedwald is supposed to have had his capital. I'm going to show you a series of images of various artefacts that have been uncovered at Sutton Hoo, uh, such as these coins that come from the Frankish kingdom, um, gold ingots and coins. As you can see, many of them have Christian devices on them. And this is what makes the ship burial at Sutton Hoo so interesting, that it, it occurred at that point when... Um, the Anglo-Saxons were converting to Christianity and there are, there's a mixture of elements of, to the grave goods. There are both pagan and Christian references within them. 
And whilst a lot of the items haven't uh, survived the acid soil very well, some of them are even in replicas such as this shoulder class. They're absolutely beautiful. The inlay work on it is just breathtaking. So Sutton Hoo is certainly the burial ground of kings, but as far as I'm aware, there are no entirely Christian burials there. I mean, there are plenty such as these. This is a burial of a horse and uh, a warrior side by side, which is clearly pagan. So after the adoption of Christianity, uh, something who didn't go out of use, as we'll see, but um, it certainly wasn't a Christian burial ground. So you've got a, a burial ground which is in a very prominent position up on a hill above the river where it can be seen by uh, boats and ships that are passing by. Um, it contains the tombs of at least one and probably several kings. And um, it must have been known that they were buried with grave goods such as these. And yet the mounds were respected. They weren't looted. They weren't uh, disrupted in any way. They were left and, and uh, presumably still treated with respect. But at the same time, there's an element of fear and suspicion about the burial ground from now on. This is a so-called sand person. It's actually a cast, as is this one here. This is a this is one that's um, out in the still out in the burial site itself. This is known as the hurdler. And what's happened with both these cases is that the body's been deposited in the ground and the acid soil has completely dissolved the body but left um, a darker area of sand to the surrounding sand. So as the archaeologists carefully um, revealed the dark area of sand, they were able to remove the lighter area and then um, make a cast of the dark area. So they ended up with these human forms, which a um, similar kind of thing in a way. I know it's not the same, but similar kind of thing to the uh, casts of the, the uh, Pompeii uh, residents. And several gallows have been found on the hill. Um, in fact, th this... Uh, image here actually shows some of the remains of the wood from a gallows which is why the guy's called a hurdler because it appears like he's leaping over the uh, the wood of the gallows so you've got a number of things going on here I mean one is that the the whole site has taken on a more sinister aspect and um, it's considered a fitting place to deposit the remains of uh, people who have been who have transgressed the law and have, have been uh, punished in some way and another is of course that the the site is in a very prominent position so these bodies hanging on gallows would have been visible for from a long way away but the other thing is that they point to a a new development in Anglo-Saxon society because in order to have punishment you must first have a law and you must have some kind of local council or authority who can judge that law and uh, pass judgment on people and inflict punishment. Again as far as I'm aware this use of the site was discontinued before the Norman conquest so it just leaves you wondering by this stage what the local memory of the site must have been. I mean, these mounds would have existed. They probably would have been covered by bracken and tall grass and so on, but they still would have been identifiable as mounds. And there surely must have been some 
local memory of ships being dragged up this hill and you can just about see the river in the distance there there's no mean feat to drag drag a ship up that hill and uh, it wouldn't have been easily forgotten by the local community but at some stage presumably it was because uh, at some point in the middle ages a field boundary was dug that cut right across the end of the mound in which the Sutton Hoo treasure was found. Um, this is a view from Mound 1, looking down the line towards that tree, looking down the line of the field, field boundary, which you can just about make out as a straight line. And what the local villagers have done is completely remove one end of the mound. I mean, possibly they might have used the earth because it was well turned soil. They might have used it on the fields. But they've then driven this field boundary right across the mound, foreshortening it. But at the same time, they've made no attempt to excavate any further into the mound. They had no memory of there being this great wealth of gold and silver and precious items within it. Um, they've just pillaged the, the mound for the soil. The great irony then being that um, when we get into the Tudor age, um, there was a deliberate policy of uh, excavating historic sites such as these tumuli and burial mounds and so on, um, because it was uh, realised at that point that there were um, items of value to be recovered from them. And that's almost certainly the reason why um, the other ship burial in Mound 2 was lacking any gold items, whereas um, you can see from the profile of Mound 1 in the distance there that uh, the right-hand side of it has been um, removed. And that actually led the Tudor workmen to believe that the ship underneath was uh, shorter than it appeared. Um, you can see a small post, modern post, planted in the ground there. That actually indicates one end of the ship, which is well beyond the, um, the end of the mound. So in the actual centre of the present mound, archaeologists found the... Uh, evidence for a Tudor excavation and at the bottom of it there were bits of Tudor pottery and so on where the uh, Tudor workmen had stopped and had a break and they'd ploughed down into what they thought was the centre of the mound to go for any treasure within and missed the actual treasure by a yard or so so it was preserved for uh, posterity and that's the reason why we're lucky to be able to view these items today, otherwise the Tudors would have just melted them down for the metal content. But it does make you think what must have been in those other mounds and what was lost. At this time, um, the Spanish were uh, plundering the Aztec and Inca gold and bringing it back to the, the old world. and. Um, up until then, the only gold in circulation had been that uh, that had existed since the you know the time of the ancient Egyptians, and the effect of all this gold surging into Europe was to devalue devalue it to the extent that um, there was enormous pressure on uh, other countries such as England to find new sources of wealth and. Um, this is one of the reasons why they went digging in all these ancient monuments to see what they could find. So just like in Mexico and Peru, these items weren't regarded as being of any artistic value or uh, historic value. They were simply looked at as lumps of gold and silver and immediately melted down um, to be minted into coins. But the uh, two ship burials at Sutton who have also yielded uh, many items that the Tudors would have ignored. Um, for instance, 
great deal of iron in the way of rivets, ship rivets and so on and there's also um, a very nice Anglo-Saxon sword which is coming up in a moment and in 1938 and 39 when Basil Brown was um, excavating the site he had the great sense to record the position of the ship rivets and so on so that he could uh, find out a great deal more about the construction of the ship but unfortunately um, there have been three ship burials found in England and all of them have been in Suffolk and the third one was actually uncovered in the Victorian era in 1862 at a place called Snape which is in Suffolk but not far away from Sutton Hoo. These are some views of Snape. Um, it's famous nowadays for Snape maltings and the Alderborough Festival which takes place there. Um, Snape is on the River Wall but the, the site of the, as far as I know the site of this third ship burial has been lost completely um, and the iron was treated with as much regard as the gold was in Tudor times that it was just melted down and given to the local blacksmith so very little information obtained from it so then we come to the 1920s and in 1925 um, an affluent couple called Frank and Edith Pretty moved into this house which had been built about 15 years earlier on the site of Sutton Hoo and of course the 1920s um, buzzed with the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt and the vast wealth of treasure that was obtained from that tomb and um, Edith Pretty in particular had a great interest in archaeology and had visited Egypt and, and the site of Howard Carter's excavation. Sadly, Frank Pretty died in the 1930s and uh, another of Edith's preoccupation became spiritualism, um, which was a prevalent fad in the 1920s and 30s as so many people tried to get in contact with uh, people that they had lost during the Great War and it was possibly a combination of these two interests that drove Edith Pretty into uh, examining the burial site and the and the mounds um, she's reputed to have uh, observed a ghostly figure of an Anglo-Saxon warrior um, on one of the mounds when she was standing on this balcony one day and um, anyway she uh, decided in 1938 to recruit an archaeologist called Basil Brown and uh, he spent two seasons on the site um, and was given the assistance of a couple of her workmen and um, they were the ones that uh, made this spectacular find. It always strikes me as well the coincidence that this was the same period when Tolkien was writing The Lord of the Rings and the British were attempting not, not so much to rewrite their history but to retrace their Anglo-Saxon heritage. Sutton who has been described as page one of English history which to my mind clearly isn't the case but um, demonstrates almost that sort of sinister parallel with um, the sort of Nazi uh, rewriting of their own history at about the, the same time. There's no denying that these artifacts have a very emotive appeal and the sight of Sutton who itself has a, a sort of melancholy atmosphere to it. But I think it's important to avoid that kind of emotional 
response to these artifacts. Um, for instance, Tolkien was convinced that he was a, such a good Anglo-Saxon speaker because he knew it instinctively and much as I admire him as a writer, I mean that's just blatant nonsense. And when you start to go down that road, you're not far off a similar kind of ideology to some of those ideas that were expressed in Germany at the same time. And then you have this next ironic coincidence that uh, war breaks out with Germany and um, the excavations are immediately put on hold and the whole of uh, the Suffolk coast to this day is still dotted with defences with some pillboxes in the distance there that you might see um, and the burial ground itself at Sutton who was uh, partly damaged by a huge trench that was dug across it to uh, spoil any glider attempts to land there as well as uh, tanks at one stage practicing maneuvers across it but when the war came to an end the Sutton Hoo helmet itself was uh, put on display at the Festival of Britain but interestingly they um, they didn't put it together quite correctly and the nasal piece that shows the the dragon was uh, left off it it wasn't actually until the early 1970s that the helmet was uh, put together in the way we see it now. So there are my thoughts on Sutton Hoo. If you ever get the chance to visit the site, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, if you do go, make sure you also uh, take the tour. I've been twice now and uh, both times I've uh, had a guide take me around as well and uh, it's really worth that extra couple of quid. There's also a fantastic exhibition centre there with um, a lot of replicas of uh, some of the artefacts as well as some of the original artefacts as well in there and uh, a reconstruction of the burial chamber itself. So thanks for watching and um, until the next video I'll say cheerio.